Hey, it's Tony and Jenny Bruski from Real Ghost Stories Online, and we need your help with something. What's that? Keeping our show on the air. As the show grows, so do the costs of producing it and distributing the audio of Real Ghost Stories Online, the very thing that you listen to probably on a regular basis. So if you listen to the show regularly, we ask you to become an EPP. That's an extra podcast person. We'll give you even more episodes of Real Ghost Stories Online to listen to in exchange for your support. It's only $5 a month, and you can sign up at realghoststoriesonline.com. Your support is what keeps our show going. Plus, we'll give you access to all of the past EPP bonus episodes of Real Ghost Stories Online, jam-packed with some of the creepiest stories we've ever gotten in, and exclusively for EPPs, more than 30 full episodes. Thanks for helping keep Real Ghost Stories Online on the air. Without your support, the show couldn't go on. Sign up now to be an EPP, extra podcast person, on the website at realghoststoriesonline.com. And thank you. Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You're about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. And on today's show, a family regrets not paying attention to the warning from a previous owner about their newly purchased home. Two college students from China are more than ready to pack up and head home after a brief stay in their apartment. A listener shares the fear she felt while house-sitting for her aunt, and there may be more at play than faulty wiring causing appliances to operate without power. Those stories, your calls, and more today on Real Ghost Stories Online. Tony and Jenny Bruski joining you once again. Hi, I have something about appliances operating without power, or really anything operating without power. Toys, you name it. If the battery's not in there, if it's not plugged in, and it's working, that to me is just one of the... I don't know, it's just, it's, it's super creepy to me, because to me it just kind of opens up this Pandora's box of what could it possibly do? Yeah. If it's... Op- I mean... A lot of times they just kind of do their thing as if they were plugged in. They play their music, they do whatever they're supposed to do, but just the fact that if it, there's something else powering it, uh-huh. what other power does it have to come through in other ways? Okay. Especially like with vocalized toys and things of that nature. Did you ever see the movie Maximum Overdrive? No. It was a... I think it was the mid 80s it was a horror movie and that's exactly what happened all these things that power tools and appliances and anything that plugged in Mm -hmm. came alive and went after people really was it like really corny oh super corny it's up there with like killer tomatoes and night of the leapers but it's it's fun to watch it's just that bad maximum overdrive yeah it ring. Have we talked about this on the show before? I've probably mentioned it to you before, so you've heard it somewhere. There's but... been some movies that you've mentioned, and we looked them up like, oh, wow, that looks awesome. And really, there was one not that long ago. I mean, it wasn't that, though. I can't think of what it was. There was the one about the giant bunnies. Oh, no, yeah, not of the Leah. Yeah, that was the, the, the Leapers. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to see that one. Yeah, this is that bad, but... It, it sticks with you all these years. I still remember that movie. Which one is worse? Would you say uh, Maximum Overdrive or Troll 2? Troll 2, but Maximum Overdrive <laughs> is pretty bad. It's right up there? Acting bad too? I think it's pretty much that bad acting-wise too. It's one of those things where you have to wonder when, when folks are doing uh, movies like that. How can you actually do good acting? <laughs> In, in such a concept, yeah. you know, you, you're, you have to work with what you're given. Mm-hmm. I mean, as far as the scripting and, and the direction, I mean, you can have bad direction, you can be a good actor and kind of override the director, if you will, and do your own thing. But at a certain point, though, it's just like this script is so bad, too. There's no way of actually delivering this in any conceivably realistic way. Yeah. And I suppose if you're you know, okay, pretend the uh, you know, the DeWalt drill is about to attack you. And the gas pump just automatically, just on its own, yeah. pours gas into your eyes. Yeah, that's... Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. You would like it. To, uh, we should just spend a day someday <laughs> just looking these movies up and just watching them and just laughing. Yeah. I, I, I'd love to see some of these things. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Of course, you can also uh, write in on the website at realghoststoriesonline.com. Duel is one I'd love to watch again. I haven't seen that one since I was a kid. That's a good one, too. That was a very creepy one. I could see that one being one of those remade movies mm -hmm. today because you could really do that one up well. Uh, even, you know, much, much more dark than what the original one was. The original one was creepy, but I think you could really make it super dark today. See, this one had, it kind of reminded me of Duel because it had semis. Okay. That would go after people. Oh, okay. So it was kind of like that. Okay, it was like a play on that that idea. Uh-huh. Interesting, interesting. Let's check that one out. All right, let's go to uh, our first story of the night. It comes in from Kat. It says, uh, hi, my name's Kat. I have a lifetime of stories to tell, but I'll start at the beginning, which is also the most disturbing of my stories. This took place in the 19... 70s. I have listened and have read thousands of ghost stories and have only ever heard of one experience like mine. I'd really love to know what you guys think and if there's anyone else out there who has had this experience. I was born and raised in Stockton, California. When I was five, we moved into an unassuming ranch-style brick house in a very well-established neighborhood. My parents had been told that seven families lived in the house in seven years little fact they didn't learn until later was that all the married couples divorced during their stay or just after selling the house. That should have been the first clue something was wrong. My parents never met the previous owners. They'd already moved out. Another red flag. I should tell you a bit about how the house was arranged. It was a typical three-bed, two-bath home. When you walk in the door, the kitchen and family room is to the right, and a few more steps, there's a long hallway to the left that leads to the bathroom and three bedrooms. This is where it all happened. My mom was at the end of this hall, and my parents' room was directly across from mine. There was nothing creepy looking about the house on the inside either. It was just a regular cookie-cutter home. Almost immediately, I started getting attacked. I'd wake up in the middle of the night screaming and in so much pain, the only way I can describe it is if Freddy Krueger was dragging his claws down the inside of my stomach. I would cry and scream, it's eating me, it's eating me. My parents had no idea what to do and would just hold me. They took me to all kinds of doctors and nothing could be found. There were no marks because I was being sliced from the inside. Nearly every night there were bangs and scratching. My dad thought there must be an animal in the attic, but could never find any evidence. A few months after moving into the house, a couple with a little girl about my age showed up while my mom and I were playing in the front yard. It turned out they were the previous owners. The girl and I started playing together, and that's when I found out that I was not the only one who feared the hallway in our house. She told me with tears in her eyes and all the desperation that six or seven year olds uh, can, ha can have uh, or can never go into the hall alone at night. She said there was a monster that lived in the hallway. I told her if she ever told anyone, if it would find her and kill her. She was so worried about me, she had to tell me. Later, I learned the first thing her parents said to my mom were, you know your house is haunted, right? My mom thought they were a little wacky, but listen to the history of the house. The first owner was a single woman who was found by neighbors one morning, beating her head against the bricks on the front of the house and violently screaming. To their knowledge, she was still in a mental hospital some seven years later. They told other stories as well of their experiences, but my mom can't recall what they told her. She thought they were just being silly and really didn't pay that much attention something she later regretted. I, however, knew better. I was plagued with experiences almost nightly. I had an alarm clock that had numbers that flipped over. Many nights I woke to see it display 13.06 p.m. I get up in the morning, run through the time, trying to find 13 on the clock, and it didn't have military time. Just a side note, we still have that alarm clock, but it's in a box in the attic. 
Other times it would go off with the creepy 70s songs like They're Coming to Take Me Away, Ha Ha, He He. I hated that song. It's awful. Do you remember that one? Yeah. I remember it like playing a lot in the early 80s still mm -hmm. when I was a kid. And it was just like, this is so bizarre. Yeah, it's it's weird. That was one of the strangest. I think we go into like the Statler Brothers. Smoking cigarettes and watching Captain Kangaroo. Remember that? No. My dad loved that record. <laughs> he played it all the time. <laughs> Just sit there listening to the record. I, I remember like those two songs together, like on the radio at the time. <laughs> that was the the lyrics to the song. <laughs> that is so bizarre. You don't remember that? <laughs> no. But don't tell me you got nothing to do. Da, 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 da. I don't remember the lyrics. Uh, okay, that. I'm gonna have to listen to that now. I'm surprised you don't know that one, because it was kind of. I mean, it was kind of country. I mean, it, it wasn't like super. Twangy country is more like folk country, -ish, I guess, if you will. I mean, you know, you've heard the Statler Brothers, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Um, and all their stuff kind of somewhat sounded alike. <laughs> Probably just insulted a lot of Statler Brothers fans, but <laughs> but they, I mean, they had a similar. They did. They, it was like they had a sound. Yeah, it was like oh, Dave Matthews has a sound, um, but in nowhere near the same way. Um, but anyway, it was just kind of along those era of. You know, very individualized songs where you're like, I'm never going to get this out of my head. Okay. And obviously, I still haven't 30 years later. Continuing on, other nights, I'd wake to hear growling under my bed, and when I would look there would be red eyes, and I could see a cold breath, but nothing else. I'd run into my parents' bed across the hall, never daring to look down the hall and jump in the middle of the king-size bed. I'd hide under, hide under their covers till morning. This was nearly a nightly occurrence. My aunt, who was only a few years older than me, would spend the night with me sometimes, and I would be attacked with her lying right next to me. She never saw or heard anything, which was so frustrating, making me feel even crazier. My mom would say, it appeared that I was asleep, or I was sleepwalking, when it first started. I had a far-off stare, and they couldn't get me to stop screaming. I felt trapped in my body, and like something was trying to claw its way out. All I could make myself do was scream. I felt I had no control over my legs, and most of the time I didn't remember how I got into my parents' room. One of these nights I heard the growls, and again, the clock was six, so I mustered all of my courage, leapt off my bed as far as I could jump. I hit the floor running. It was only about ten. Uh, ten feet from my... Or ten, ten inches? Ten feet? I always do this wrong. Ten feet. Ten feet, okay. I always... I, I confuse the... the apostrophe... From the quotation mark? Yeah, I, I forget what that means. Ten feet. Feet is one. Of yeah. Them. Quotation is, is inches. Uh-huh. Okay. I'll try and remember that. I, I know I won't, but I'll try. <laughs> Ten feet from my bed to my parents' room. But it felt like miles with my small legs. I hit the hallway and froze. I have no idea what made me stop or why I looked, but I did. Walking about two feet off the floor was a woman dressed similar to a nun glowing all yellow with a lantern in her hand. She didn't seem to see me. She just stared straight ahead. There was nothing evil looking about her, but something told me if I stayed there and she reached me, I would never be seen again. Somehow I made my legs work and jumped into my parents' bed with such force it woke them up. I couldn't speak. I just hid under the blanket and shook like a leaf. I didn't tell them for years what I saw that night or any night. My grandma saw the monster that I now know was a demon the second year we lived there. My parents had a strange experience. Those are stories for another time. We stayed there for three years and my parents are still together. I tried to research the history of the land and the house but found nothing. If anyone has had the stomach pains, please tell me your story. And as a side note, as soon as we left that house, I never had an attack again. Like I said earlier, I have a lifetime of stories. I'll share another time. Thank, thanks so much for doing your show and giving us a place to share these experiences. I love ghost stories and have always loved the supernatural. Just a fun fact about me, I drove two hearses for many years. One was white and one was black. They were my personal cars. Hearses are such a blast to drive. Unfortunately, neither one was haunted, but I did carry a coffin in the back in case I got any volunteers. In the past year, I sold my black hearse and bought a more practical convertible, which is not as much fun, but better on gas. That's my kind of person. The hearse is more fun than the, than the convertible. It's like the uh, the daughter on uh, Six Feet Under. 
Yeah. She drove a uh, a like a 60s olive green mm-hmm. hearse around. It was kind of cool. That uh, was very cool. Very interesting. This this story I could see us getting a letter at some point in the next couple of years of someone going, uh, was this the house at, you know, XXX address? Uh-huh. Because seven families, she said. Had in been seven a, years. In seven years. Um, where, you know, people who are affected by these things tend to seek out information on the topic. Yes. And we're one of those sources now that uh, provides information on the topic, if you will. Probably one of the more in-depth ones that exists out there online as far as people sharing their stories Mm -hmm. uh, verbally. Um, So if this is something that, you know, if it sounds familiar or something, we would definitely love to hear, uh, you know, your uh, your take on it, what what happened with you, even if it is five years later, because that's the interesting thing about shows now. They exist into infinity. Yeah. So we could get a call 10 years from now from someone, you know, going way back in the archive going, hey. Right. Right. Well, what's interesting to me about this is it almost sounds almost like a possession, but not a possession. Mm -hmm. Being that it seemed like it was something within her that was tearing her up, you know, and I would venture to say that this was much more severe than some of the anxiety pains that children have that they get the stomach pains sure. from terrible anxiety. And I think that this sounded just ridiculously severe for what, you know, for as little as she was. Yeah. So that makes it in a whole different category for me because I've never heard of anything like that. And I don't know if possession is the right word. I get where you're coming from sure. on that, where, you know, it's, it's like something that's invaded the body, mm-hmm. but maybe not the mind. Yeah. And that's why I said it kind of sounded like it, but not. And that's, yeah. What would you call that? I don't even know. I don't even know if that's like the beginning of a possession. I think that this is just a whole different An monster. No pun intended. What, what's, what makes it so different than like saying a spirit attacked me is that it typically when you think of an attack, the the feelings and if there's markings tend to be on the outside uh-huh. physically. This is interesting where it's, it feels like it's coming from the inside mm-hmm. out, which... I don't even know. I don't know if there's a word for that. There probably is. Someone maybe can fill us in, but that's a new one. Yeah, and I can't believe that she and her family endured that for three years yeah. before they were able to move. We should get a little bell in here and ding it every time we hear a story where we go, that's a new one. Or we could just say that's a new one. True, but you could do it like during the story. Like if you hear oh. it and you're like, I don't, I don't think this is new. Because we'll start to sound like the guy on Breaking Bad. Just a constant <laughs> ding in the background. And eventually we explode. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather just say that's a new one. That would be uh, interesting. Yeah, and I think I that is a new one. It would be interesting if anyone else has any, uh, any insight into that. I just did an interview earlier today where somebody had asked me about, um, you know, why do you think ghost stories or why there's such an interest in ghost stories? Um, or the paranormal. And I said it's because I think so many of us have had, and this is me paraphrasing what I said, um, a, a, an unknown or a paranormal experience in some way, shape, or form. And we're out there trying to seek out others who've had something similar to make us feel more normal about it. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that we're not so, you know, so you don't feel crazy because there's there's no reason to feel crazy, but you do because people don't speak of it. It's still kind of taboo. It is. It's like, oh, it's like, I I would venture to say 90% of our population has had something paranormal happen to them. Mm -hmm. As far as the amount that are actually vocalizing it, probably a lot. Or they believe into it or they believe in it and they want something to happen. Sure. Or write it off as something else. Yeah. You know, I, I, but I would think it's, it's a majority. Mm-hmm. who have had something happen, and that's why I think it's so popular. Do you think people are more accepting now? Yeah, I mean, I think just the fact that it's it's so open in media, it's not just, like, limited to, you know, you don't have to listen to middle-of-the-night radio now to discuss or hear a show about it, you know, yeah. with the advent of podcasting and such. It's it's so much more open, and that that's another thing I talked about is, is you know, 
to, at this day and age, you know, also the topics you, we can discuss on a show like this, we don't have to worry about broadcast standards either of what can we say, what can't we say. And it's not about swearing. I mean, although there is a fair share of that, but it's not necessarily needed to get a story across. No. It's But some of the stories are pretty damn dark. Oh, yeah. And, you know, a lot of it just would never have fly, you know, flown on network radio well, sure. know, back in the day, you know, or today uh, as far as what's out there. So just there's so many outlets. It's uh, so mainstream. It's on mainstream networks, you know, pretty much Friday nights on Travel Channel, I think, are like devoted to paranormal stuff still. Mm-hmm. At, at least some networks are. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think all of that, just the fact that it's talked about opens it up so much more today than ever before. And just the outlets. The outlets exist. We exist. You know, there's other shows out there that exist about the topic in, in various shapes and form. And, you know, there's there's a way to communicate it. Yeah, I agree. So it, it's, it's a good thing, I, I really think. Oh, yeah, I think it's a good thing. I think we're on the very verge of having some kind of undeniable, provable evidence that everybody's going to be like, okay, we now have to live in a world where everybody has to acknowledge that it goes surreal. It's a paranormal revolution. Yeah. There you go. Ken writes in, this story happened about 40 years ago in West Virginia. My uncle Steve and two of his friends, Jason and John, moved from Asia to West Virginia to attend West Virginia University in Morgantown. The first year was somewhat of a culture shock to them, all having lived in Hong Kong all their lives. The food was different to them, as was the entire college experience. They quickly acclimated and blended right in. Nothing eventful happened the freshman year, but that was all about to change sophomore year. Sophomore years roll around, and the three of them decide to share an apartment off campus. They found a two-bedroom apartment about 10 miles from the university. The apartment was three floors. The owner, landlord, an elderly man lived on the first floor, and my uncle and his friends shared the second floor. Upon moving in, the landlord gave them two strict warnings. One, no more than eight people are allowed in the unit at any given time, no parties. And two, no one is allowed to venture into the third floor apartment. When they asked why not, He answered that it's being remodeled and could be dangerous. Fast forward to November during Thanksgiving break, my uncle came to stay with us in New York. This left the other two roommates, the apartment all to themselves. The day after Thanksgiving, we get a call from one of his friends, Jason, hysterically telling my uncle that they need to leave the apartment and go back to Hong Kong. My uncle being the level-headed one in the group, calmed his friend down enough to find out what happened. Apparently, the night before, Jason and John had been doing laundry in the basement of their apartment. The dryer was broken, so they decided to hang their clothing up around the apartment to dry. They soon ran out of coat hangers and decided to ask the landlord to borrow some. Upon knocking on his door, they realized he was not home. Being the reckless college students they were, they went into the third floor apartment through the balcony window. Once inside, they noticed that the apartment was not being remodeled and the owner had indicated, or as the owner had indicated, but was completely furnished. But they noticed something else was not right about the place. The decor was very outdated, but tidy. It didn't seem to have been lived in, as there was a thin layer of dust on everything. Thinking nothing of it, they went around the apartment and found a closet with some coat hangers. They noticed a few articles of clothing still on some of the hangers, but thought nothing of it and went back to their apartment to finish up their laundry. That night, Jason, who usually shared his room with my uncle, was awakened by someone sitting on his back. He was unable to move his body and thought that it was his friend John playing a prank on him. As soon as he tried to fight the unseen force, it quickly dissipated. He goes back to sleep as soon as it happens again. On the third time, he forces himself to roll off the bed and screams, Cut it out! At that point, he realizes it wasn't his friend playing a trick on him. He looks toward the light in the hall and sees a girl's head. Probably meant face, but could be lost in translation as the story was told to me in Chinese, staring at him. There was no other part of the girl except for the girl's head floating near the light in the hall. At first, he wasn't sure what he was seeing, but when he reached for his glasses and put them on, he knew exactly what it was. 
He described her as having somewhat of a puffy face, colorless and emotionless, like she was a picture. He cried out for his friend, and as soon as he did that, it disappeared. His friend tried to console him, but it was no use. He refused to be in any of the rooms alone from that point forward. When my uncle finally returned back to the apartment a few days later, he asked the landlord about the third floor. Without missing a beat, the landlord replies, You went in there, didn't you? And I told you not to. The landlord explains that some time ago, a young woman had hung herself in one of the closets. Her family claimed a few of her belongings, but told the landlord to either donate or throw the items away. He decided to keep it furnished in hopes he could rent it out, but no tenants ever stayed very long in that apartment. When he decided it was time to clear everything out, he would feel very uneasy being on the third floor, so much so that he just left it as is and never went back up there. Needless to say, this did not sit well with my uncle and his friends, and soon they moved out. Every once in a while, that story would come up during Thanksgiving, but my uncle would always conveniently change the topic. Thanks for reading. Okay, so my question is, if the landlord got rid of all the items within the apartment, do you think it would still be haunted, or do you think that that would help? I... It's an interesting question um, because there's a lot of stories that sometimes seem to suggest that you can almost bring out a haunting if you are to surround a ghost or a haunted atmosphere with objects that were similar to it in its life. For example, if you were dealing with a ghost that died, you know, mid-century, and mm -hmm. then you went and filled that space that's supposedly haunted with mid-century, modern-esque type furniture, uh -huh. that that sometimes brings out the ghost. You kind of make it feel at home. Exactly. Okay. So, feeling at home with its own furniture and such there, I think could likely make it feel a little more welcome mm -hmm. and able to come out. Removing the furniture, I don't think that that necessarily will make it go away. Okay. But I could see it essentially turning the volume down from maybe an eight to a two. Yeah. I mean, the fact is she hung herself in the apartment, so she may linger within the apartment no matter what. I just wondered if keeping everything as it was played a, a factor into not being able to even rent the apartment. Sure. It's like she still lives there. I could see that. Okay. You know, um, an interesting case, and this is, you know, could be a whole, you know, long drawn out topic, but the, uh, I believe the Amityville house, uh, when they went into it, a lot of the furniture from the DeFeo family was still in it. Uh -huh. And it was part of the sale. Oh, it was like an as-is sale, so everything's included. It's like, hey, you get the beds, you get... Oh, gosh. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm assuming the mattresses were changed. Um, but bed frames and such, uh -huh. a lot of that all still coming with the house. Um, so the Lutzes ended up having a lot of that stuff. Like, their kids were sleeping on at least the same bed frames that those kids were killed in yeah um so th to that you know factor there you have to wonder because that runs so many levels deep of okay the initial murders mm -hmm. that occurred there initially blamed on possession initially blamed on paranormal later he came out and said he made the whole damn thing up um but that was the original story. Okay. Um, so you have to wonder, was that somewhat really the case? Um, dig deeper into it then. You have the murders that actually happen. Then do you actually have um, maybe something completely different or just added to the mix of negative energy that's haunting the place um, that goes beyond whatever caused the original murder to take place 
um, when you have all the new bodies that were, you know, and, and, and people that were taken out in that home. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Level to level to level. Yeah. Of just in, turning up the volume, essentially, on your odds of paranormal activity. Had he not ever said anything about there being a... Uh, a demon or something possessing him. He just uh, say he was just a, a, a murderer. Mm -hmm. Just I just went and killed my family because I was nuts, or you know, or whatever. You know, I hated them. Whatever. Um, take paranormal out of the whole equation. You'd still probably look at that house as a good candidate for a haunting, right? Um, with just the murders alone, yeah, that occurred. Um, but the thing is, it goes back before the murders of there being claims of paranormal activity sure so uh, uh, then going back to the furniture okay <laughs> um you know putting all that in there then you have the furniture that was there for that and on all the possessions that i would think just amp it up even higher what i'm kind of getting is just the levels of amping up your odds of paranormal activity yeah it just layers and upon itself yeah i just wonder if if he tried getting rid of the stuff, if that would help, it may really piss her off and sure. she might come out with a vengeance, but you aren't going to know. Cause right now, you know, just sitting there with the apartment empty furnished mm -hmm. isn't working. Would you ever get furniture from a home that had something bad happen in it even if the furniture wasn't involved in like directly with whatever happened say there was a murder in a home but you're at an estate sale you find just a great piece it was in the living room the murders happened in the bedroom on the third floor living rooms on the mm -hmm. not even touched by uh -huh. anything physically going on in that scene would you be comfortable getting that beautiful china hutch <laughs> or, or whatever it may be no and here's why not just because it came from a property with a stigma but because you don't know how attached that person that died was to that piece of furniture okay that may have been their most favorite heirloom piece they ever had sure and they are not going to give that up they are going with it I'm not willing to take that heirloom piece of furniture and the ghost with it to my new home because I just don't, I don't want to mess with that. And I think when you're killed that quickly, I think it makes it a higher chance of having a haunting, can you, you know? If you're the ghost, can you only pick one piece of furniture to go with or can you go with multiple pieces? We don't know that, so I'm not taking that chance. That's an interesting thought though because we've had some stories with that that's one of those things where we've had before where we kind of go oh that's a new one <laughs> but here's the thing tony if we did that if we had a piece of furniture in our home that we bought at an estate sale from somebody who died during a murder or some other horrific thing within the home every time you look at that piece of furniture what are you gonna think murder <laughs> Murder yeah, house. you're right. I was trying to think of some sort of smart ass thing to say. No. And I had nothing. No, it's nothing. it's gonna be right there yeah. in your mind and who wants to do that? Constantly think about, oh man, that came from some lady that got de decapitated or whatever, you know? But look how it it, it, it holds those plates. <laughs> Jeez, I'm not. I'm not yeah. sure I could handle that. Okay, interesting. I I, I think I'm, I'm I am right there with you on that. Okay. I really wanted to have something smart ass to say there, but I had nothing. Sorry, nothing. I got you this one time. Damn it. Hey, if you like the show, you want to support it, keep us on the air, consider becoming an EPP. That's an extra podcast person. You get a bonus episode of the show sent to you every single week. Up to 31 of them now. You get an instant access to when you sign up. It's only five bucks a month, or you can do the full year option. Sign up for one full year in one fell swoop. You don't have to worry about every single month, PayPal doing the thing. Just uh, sign up. Either way, the options are there for you on the website, realghoststoriesonline.com, and that helps keep this show a going. Dominique writes in, hi, Tony and Jenny. I sent this half finished the other day by accident, so I hope you ignore that one and read this. For Tony's benefit, I'm replacing the name of my friend with the name of my friend's dog, Spud. Yes, he is a potato. There we go. Awesome. That All made right. me think of Spuds McKenzie. Do you remember Spuds McKenzie? Yes, McKenzie? I do remember Spuds McKenzie. I had to Google it because I couldn't remember if it was Suds McKenzie because it was for Bud Light, but it was Spuds like a potato. Was he just the beer dog or was he in other things too, which is just beer? I think he was pretty popular during the 80s, but I don't 
remember him as anything other than the the terrier with the dot on his eye. Sure. All white. I think he was like one of those like multi-purpose dogs that was like endorsing different products or something. I think he was just Bud Light's property. Was it? But okay. then he probably went on to do other things. Where Morris the cat? Yes. Yeah. What was that? Nine Lives? I think so. Yeah. Frisky's the cat never really had a name. No. Okay. Anyway, continuing on. Growing up, there was this creepy barn in my backyard. I spent a lot of time rifling through old magazines and boxes, and one day I found something interesting. I found a board with letters on it. I brought it to my mom and asked her what it was. She explained to me that it was a Ouija board and it was used to talk to spirits. I asked if I could have it. She told me to go ahead since she didn't believe in any of that stuff. I was ecstatic. At first I kept it on my wall like a trophy, but it fell off a few times for no reason. I figured it was unstable, so I put it in the closet for a while. The closet would remain cold day or night after this. I'd hear little creaks and shuffling in my closet when there was nobody or nothing in there. Most of these things can be explained easily by a creaky house or my imagination, so naturally I ignored it. It wasn't until one Halloween when I knew it was real. My friend Spud and I lived in a rural area where trick-or-treating was too much of a walk with no reward, so we decided to stay home and watch horror movies. Then I pulled the board out. Spud and I began to play with the board, asking normal type shit. Whatever was in the board kept telling Spud dirty things. I said it was going to rape her with a jello cup. No Cosby jokes. I'm not. Okay. I thought you, I thought you were going to say like I read that wrong. I'm like that's a pretty messy wrong. No. Okay. That's what she wrote. But I wasn't honestly I wasn't even uh, believe it or not I wasn't even going there. It didn't even cross my mind. Okay. I think it's just been kind of out of the vernacular. Of, I just knew you were going to go there. This has been kind of out of pop culture for a couple weeks, so. All right. Well, I'm behind the times. Proceed on, please. No. <laughs> Should I make one now? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Which amused us to some extent. It wasn't until we asked it to move or touch something that shit got real. I had one of those bears. <laughs> what are you laughing about? The way I said shit got real? Shit got real. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to accentuate that. Move or touch something that shit got real. It's like a movie trailer. I had one of those bears that had a button in its hand that upon being pressed would play music. Can you guess what happened next? Across the room, the bear started playing a tune. Spud and I looked at each other. We weren't scared, but knew we were dealing with something strong. We tried to force it to close by saying goodbye, but whatever it was wouldn't say goodbye. This left the board open, although we didn't know it at the time. The board went back in the closet for a while. I'd hear more deliberate noises, and although my closet had one sliding door and was open to the sunlight, it still remained cold. It wasn't until my sister yelled at me to stop making noise one night that I decided it couldn't be in my room. I didn't want to let go of the board due to my horror and paranormal obsession, so I put it in the garage. Being a teenager now, I liked to talk on the phone at night, but had to go where I wasn't heard, so naturally, I went to the garage. In the night, objects would fall or tip over, some things I would ignore. It was one night when I was in there when I was talking on the phone. Something creaked and shuffled, and I looked up, scared but calm, Then something hit the garage door. It rumbled and shook from the hit. I jumped and stopped talking so I could listen. I walked over to look around and make sure it wasn't my cat jumping on the door and looked to get it uh, in or out. I poked around and saw and heard nothing. I started to leave the garage and heard a small bang on the door with some shuffling towards me. Without turning around, I squirmed inside, scared. The next day, I took the board, chucked it in the trash. Now I know a couple ways to destroy one without releasing anything, but mind you, my mom already thought... I was weird, and burning or drowning the board would I made her think I was even more nuts. I wish I could tell you what happened to the board, but I have no idea. I hope Tony's need for a name to be replaced with an animal's name is satisfied for the time being. This name isn't as good as Fluffles, but who the hell names their animal Fluffles? Anyway, I hope you liked my story, and have a great day. The answer to that question, oh, who the hell names their animal Fluffles? You? Well, close to. Scruffles. Yeah. 
And, and it was all, I'll tell that story in a minute, but let's, let's react to the story first. Well, my question is, I would want to be, well, I guess it's not really a question. I guess it's more of a statement, but I think I would want to be in the know on where that board ended up because my fear would be like, it's in a box of stuff. You know, she was a teenager. You're getting ready to move out, go to college, and it ends up going with you. Mm -hmm. I'd want to know the whereabouts of the board, especially since it seemed to be that it would not allow the conversation to close. It's like one of those things at the end of a movie where you throw it in the dumpster and like the horror has ended. And then the, the camera's kind of panning out down the road and there's some little kids riding his bike down, his big wheels down the road. Mm -hmm. Gets up, sees it. What's this? The alphabet. Yeah. You know, and puts it in the back of his big wheels and drives away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fade to black and then, you know, it's like the, the sequel comes out. It makes you wonder what kind of spirit they were dealing with if it was yeah. just trying to be as profane as possible. And choosing a jello cup <laughs> of all things, that makes me think it was pretty young. Dark. Pretty dark, but pretty young. Like a young, young dark spirit? That or somebody trying to sound darker than they were. Yeah. Like who even... As an adult, how often do you think of a Jello cup anyway? I, I don't know. I don't. So I'm just thinking that maybe it was something trying to be bigger and badder than it really was sure i mean th th there's different levels to it mm -hmm. so yeah very interesting story um on the scruffles topic okay i uh on the radio back in the old radio days yeah and the fm broadcast days um when i was a teenager and i had my uh, afternoon radio show on a rock radio station um i would do these these prank calls and you know it's back when you know you could you know kind of get away with that and it was somewhat original and like everyone in the world wasn't doing it um i i had this this character cat scruffles is what i called it on the air and i i picked that name just because it was such a, a such a silly name you know for a pet and it was kind of like I, I just thought it was silly you know than that for being a pet's name uh -huh. and the cat would be involved in the prank calls in in every which horrible way you know, could be involved. It got caught in the, the washing machine once and calling Sears Home Appliance to try and get advice on how to get it out. Sure. I mean, you name it, it happened. Uh -huh. with, and it was a reoccurring fake cat. Um, and I love cats. Um, but I also find animal humor very funny. Um, so anyway, I did the character for so long with this cat. And eventually, um, I mean, I was doing this in high school. I was on the air on an FM rock station in high school when i moved out at 18 um i went to top 40 radio had my own place finally and uh then i got my own cat so what did i name it scruffles of course so and and the cat's still alive yeah. actually it's it's living with my parents these days and it growls when it sees you <laughs> <laughs> it does. It used to be such a friendly cat. That's the it's a friendly cat to everybody else. It just doesn't like you. It knows when you come home that it's bad news. The funny thing is, the whole time I had that cat, it was so loving to me. I mean, it was never, like, mean to me. I had to get rid of it because of my allergies. Um, and I just, I, I couldn't breathe at, to a certain point. And the funny thing is, it's like, after, like, my mom started influencing it. And my mom's really... The cat loves my mom. I think my mom turned the cat against me. No, I think your mom showed it how it should be treated. And I treated it well. Now it knows, oh, okay, I'm not going back to that. I was really nice to that cat. It slept on my bed. It was... I really enjoyed it. It was like... It was my companion for a long time. And it was a really... It was weird because that cat like never hissed. I mm -hmm. thought there was something wrong with it. Mm -hmm. Seriously, like mentally wrong with the cat because like it didn't hiss at anything. Uh -huh. And like normally like, you know, not that I was provoking the cat, but you know, if there's a, I was in a, an apartment and there's other animals, dogs, this and that, and I've had other cats, you know, they get upset when they see another animal or something. They get defensive, especially cats. And it was just so passive the whole time I had it and that's why when I went back to you know go back to visit it's like aggressive it's kind of pissy and it just used to be the most loving kind <laughs> I don't know what happened I just don't know <laughs> <laughs>
Maybe she switched out the. Maybe she switched out of the cat on me and didn't no, want to tell me that Scruffles that's really died. The real Scruffles. You okay. know that's the real Scruffles. <laughs> oh my gosh! Just like she did with a hamster when I was eight. <laughs> she did it with my cat when I was thirty. <laughs> Alyssa writes in, Hi, Tony and Jenny. I recently sent in a story my grandmother told me, and I would like to share an experience of my own. I have two aunts who live a few houses away from each other, Anne and Mary. My younger aunt, uh, Mary's husband, Philip, died in her home from cancer years ago. I was very young when he died, maybe about five or six years old. From what I do remember, he was a nice man. They used to babysit me a lot, so I would say I had a, a closeness with him. I actually lived with him one summer when I was around 14 and never experienced anything out of the ordinary. Although when my cousins would spend the night, they would always bring up the fact that her home could be haunted, but I never actually believed it since my aunt or anyone else had, had ever experienced anything then. Flash forward a few years, I was 18, staying at her home for the weekends as I lived out of town at the time. My aunt herself was out of town and let me stay there whenever I came back up to the Bay Area to visit. The night I arrived and I decided to shower before bed, I clearly remember closing and locking the door in the bathroom and having a bag with my shampoo and soap in it that I brought. I realized my aunt had left a new bottle of shampoo and all other necessities for my stay at her house, so I left my bag at the sink. Once I was finished showering, I opened the curtain and realized that the bag had, uh, was now on the floor and the door was halfway open. First thought in my mind was maybe that my aunt Anne, who lived a few houses down, came to check on me as I knew she had a key to the house. It then came to mind that there is no one way she could have unlocked the bathroom door as it was a standard doorknob with no key entry on the other side. I just had this feeling something wasn't right. My heart began to race as I threw my clothes on and ran right out the front door and slammed it shut, not even thinking twice to lock it. I ran to my Aunt Anne's and my uncle what had just happened. We sat there trying to come up with reasonable explanations how this could have happened, like maybe I thought I left my bag in the sink, but I dropped it on the floor. Could have been too tired for my drive to remember that. Highly unlikely, but possible. But what about the door being opened? I know I locked it since I was all alone and it was late at night. We thought maybe I didn't completely close the door as I thought I had, and maybe a draft pushed it open halfway. About every possible explanation we could think of. My uncle said sarcastically, he is such a joker, maybe it was Philip. I didn't want to admit that I was thinking the same thing. Please keep the story in mind as there are two other experiences that follow this. Thank you in advance for sharing my story, Alyssa G. I would be willing to bet that something did happen because why would you put your bag on the floor like that if you remember distinctly putting it in the sink? Mm -hmm. and most women I think unless you know you've got a, a kid in the other room that's kind of entertaining itself and you're trying to get a shower we, we close the shower door we like our privacy mm -hmm. unless we're trying to keep one ear on you know sure. a 10 year old that's playing video games in the next room so <sighs> and, and also you're probably going to be more cognizant too of letting as a courtesy the other woman know Hey, by the way, I'm here. Just doing this. Keep doing your thing just so you're not disturbed yeah. thinking some rapist wandered in your house and yeah. is hiding in the closet. Absolutely. You know, it just matter of fact courtesy, especially a family member. Oh, yeah. You know, it'd be one thing if like the maid or something came in and it was a cleaning service and like, uh, uh, unknowing that somebody's there. Well, and... This is a pretty big generalization, but I'm betting that if it had been one of the aunts, you know, either the one that lived there or the one down the street, they came in, they saw she was in the shower, needed to use the sink or whatever, they're going to probably put whatever it was they put on the floor back in the sink mm -hmm. where it was. That's what you do. You just put things back where you found them. Sure. And it just is old hat for yeah. females, you know, so I'm betting that there was something going on in that house yeah i would i i would agree i'd love to hear the uh the other stories that uh she mentioned she has mm -hmm. so please do write back in 
Uh, 855-853-4802. That's our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. If you've not already done so, please press subscribe, whatever platform it is you listen to us on. iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube. Plenty of ways for you to subscribe to the show and make sure you don't miss any episodes. If you're listening to us on Dark Matter Radio, thank you. Welcome. Um, you can check out our complete archive of shows through uh, through iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or on our website. Uh, lots of ways to uh, get your ghost on, if you will, uh, anytime you want. Christina writes in, Hi, Tony and Jenny. I've emailed a couple times in the past to give alternative ideas of stuff that has happened, especially with phones. I work for a phone company, so I can help explain some things. I have a lot of respect in the fact that if there is some type of alternative explanation, you guys have no trouble exploring it. Don't get me wrong, I believe in the paranormal, but sometimes people get some solace from knowing there's an alternative explanation. I just listened to Logan's story from last week where his grandma's phone rang him. Generally, phone companies have to keep a telephone number out of circulation for at least 90 days. I personally think it was his grandma. On a different note, I have a quick story for you. My family has had just a handful of supernatural experiences throughout the years. I only have one reoccurring situation. Ever since I can remember, my bed would shake either when I'm starting to fall asleep or when I'm waking up in the morning. I like to think that I was already waking up before the bed would shake in the morning, but I can't really be sure. It happened often, but was never in every night's occurrence. I never have paralysis when this happens. I can move around. I usually ask several times to leave, sometimes going as far as invoking the name of Christ. It eventually stops, but not until I go so far as invoking the name. I've heard on paranormal shows that this is not something paranormal. It's a half-consciousness phenomena that many people experience, so it hasn't ever concerned me that much. So fast forward to when I was 22 years old, a roommate and I had gone to see The Ring in the theater. Holy crap, that's the scariest movie I've ever seen. I had trouble sleeping for several weeks after we saw that movie. One night, I was alone in my apartment. One roommate was working overnight, and the other was at her boyfriend's house. I stayed up late reading because I was a little freaked out. After several hours, I decided to go to bed with the light on that night because I was still a little freaked out about that movie and also because I've never been much of a fan of being alone in an apartment. It's how all true crime shows start. She was alone in her apartment. So I settled into bed that night to over uh, the overhead light burning bright. I had an even started drifting off, still pretty wide awake when my bed started shaking. I asked and pleaded for it to stop, invoking the name of Christ several times when a distant man's voice said clearly in my ear, No. It shook harder for a few more seconds and then stopped. I froze, terrified. I then heard someone walk down the stairs in our apartment and stop at the landing. I called out for my roommates, thinking maybe someone was home, and I didn't remember. I was too scared to go out of my room and check. I turned on the TV and stayed awake the rest of the night until one of my roommates got home from work. I verified that she was, indeed, working all night. I checked with the other roommate later that day, and she was at her boyfriend's all night. Who knows, maybe I drifted off and didn't know it, but I felt awake when it happened and stayed awake the rest of the night. Up here in the frozen tundra of Minnesota, we don't have earthquakes. I lived in Mexico briefly years after this happened. It definitely wasn't anything like an earthquake either. Thanks for taking the time to read my story. I hope you guys have a swell day. Christina. I would put this in the same category as sleep paralysis and here's the reason why because sometimes sleep paralysis is just something that happens when you're in that in-between state and sometimes there's paranormal going along with it Mm -hmm. i think sometimes the shaking syndrome which that's not what it's really called but that's what i'm calling it okay happens and it's just kind of an in-between state like sleep paralysis and when you have a shaking like that and you have a distinct voice in your ear telling you no when you ask it to stop there's something more going on so i think because we have a lot of shaking syndrome or shaking type stories like that where i felt my bed shake and then mm-hmm. it stopped you know i think that it it's one of those things where it can kind of 
go both ways. Do you think the bed's actually shaking in those cases? Or do you think it's more so the sensation of it? Just like when you're halfway asleep and you, you feel like you're running or falling and suddenly you start kicking your legs and such. Is that in that family of sensations, if you will? I think it's different because... People know when it's them shaking versus something shaking them. Sure. Meaning that, you know how sometimes people shake when they're almost asleep? I know I do it. Yeah. And I know it's me. I, I don't even suspect that it's something else. Yeah. But if it's the bed shaking and you're not moving, that's a whole different sensation. And I think people are able to differentiate between the yeah. two, even in an almost sleep state. I agree. I think I'd be jumping off that bed really quick. Yeah. I think that'd be literally my first reaction is pop up, jump off. Uh-huh. And I, I've i never had that happen. I've had the exploding head syndrome. Yeah. Which actually, I want to talk about this, and we'll talk about it maybe in tomorrow's show. Um, but there was, uh, actually it was in mainstream uh article the other day uh, cbs news uh did a story on it oh really about it being a very 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 common thing okay because there's actually some new research out about it um and actually college students mm -hmm. experiencing it um I, I haven't read the whole thing a friend of mine todd actually i saw posted an article uh, a link to it on facebook and todd's written into the show before sure um way back um but uh, I, I want to read it and we can talk about it, share it on uh, maybe tomorrow's episode or, or Monday's episode at this point. Um, but it's it, interesting. Uh, it was just it was neat to see it kind of being talked about more so than just on our show. <laughs> I wonder if it has anything to do with stress. I really think it does. Mm -hmm. I think it has a lot to do with stress because I, I think it's one of those things where you are in a a state of not quite being able to fall asleep mm -hmm. and you're still being somewhat awoken by other things and that's when it I mean, that's when it occurs for me okay more than any time is when i'm not getting a good night's sleep and i'm having difficulty falling asleep it's like right probably close to that area where you could fall into sleep paralysis mm -hmm. um where you're not fully there yet so I, I think it does. Anyway, we'll talk about that more on, uh, on Monday show. Connie writes in, hi, Tony and Jenny. Love your show. Listen every day while I'm working. I have an experience I'd like to share, although I don't know if I can really bold, or it can be really called a ghost story. This happened when I was around 13 or 14 years old. I was on my spring break. My mom and dad had gone to work and had allowed me to sleep in. When I woke up, I started getting dressed and was sitting on the side of my bed, putting on my shoes. I had on one shoe. I was reaching for the other when the window unit's air conditioner came on. At first, I didn't really think anything about it. I just reached back to turn it off. Then I realized it was already in the off position. I pressed a couple of buttons and turned a couple of knobs and nothing changed. It just kept running. At that point, I was starting to freak out, so I reached down to unplug it, thinking surely that would make it stop. It was already unplugged. I totally freaked out, ran out of the house, went to my safe haven, my grandmother. Thankfully, she lived only two houses away. So anyway, I spent the day with my grandmother. I had to tell her what happened because she was curious as to why I was so pale when I got to her house. She told me just to calm down and that everything would be fine. As the day wore on, I tried to forget about the experience. When my mom got home from work, I felt safe enough to go back. I told mom about what had happened, and I'm pretty sure she thought I was making it up. We started making dinner, and mom told me to go grab some socks from my room. It was still a bit cold, and my mom wanted a pair of fuzzy socks. I was scared, but I didn't really have a choice, so off I went. Went into my room, opened the drawer, reached into the drawer, and the AC unit came on again. I screamed and ran out of the room. My mom went in to see what was going on. She saw that it was turned off and unplugged, but was still running. She was convinced at that point that I wasn't making it up and was just as upset as I was. When my dad got home from work, we told him all about it. He had a friend that was an electrician, so he called him, came to check it out the next day. The electrician couldn't find anything wrong with it and said there was probably a short in the line. I'm not an electrician, and I understand that sometimes AC units can hold a charge for a little while, but I never believed that it could have held a charge from the previous summer, and I couldn't figure out how there could be a short in the line when there was no power going into it. 
To my knowledge, it never happened again, but I moved out of that room the following day after my parents got home, and I spent the rest of that spring break with my grandmother. So that's one of my stories. I hope you enjoy. Thanks. Okay. That would take a lot of energy, wouldn't it, for a ghost to power something like that? Yeah, because typically those are on even uh, higher GFI plugs than regular. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like a refrigerator plug or, or like a dryer or a, a washing machine. You know, the sure. giant plugs. Yeah. Um, so those do take a lot of electricity to run. Then what do you think? I, I think there's no doubt it was paranormal. Okay. I, mean, uh, I mean, so at the beginning of the story, we uh, said, I'm not sure this is paranormal. Oh, be sure. It's paranormal. It's, it's very paranormal. Um, things like that. Again, I mean, you, you, you can hold a charge. I mean, you could prob- theoretically hold a charge over summer. Mm-hmm. But that charge is going to last all of 0.05 of a second. Yeah. You turn it on, gung, dead. It's That's not going it. to go off in the morning and then go off in the evening. No. Cycle throughout the day with no power <laughs> it's not, source. It's not going to do anything. And then once that charge is done the first time, mm-hmm. it's done. It's not coming back. So, yeah, there was clearly something else powering. That. I mean, unless there was some sort of battery backup on it, which I would assume the electrician would have found. Yeah. Had that existed on it. But things like that, no, they're not going, they're not even going to run. I mean, they're going to get that initial surge. Mm -hmm. You may get the fan to rotate for a little second, but that's it. Well, I think it says something that obviously she saw it and her parents didn't believe her because it's not something that generally can happen. And then once her parents saw it happen, they rolled out all the possibilities of what it could be and called in an electrician who then ruled out all the possibilities. So you have, mm-hmm. you know, three adults at the time trying to figure out why this unit is running and there's no explanation. So I really think as much power as it took, that's what made me wonder if it was paranormal or not, if the if the yeah. ghost had enough power to run it. Well, it, it had clearly something. It did. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm happy it stopped at the AC unit. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it didn't go any further because clearly I think there'll be one powerful ghost or entity um, if it's able to power an AC unit. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's probably not as comparable as powering a car, but it's up there. I mean, it's a large appliance. It's one thing to have it power a transistor radio for a couple seconds. It's a whole other thing to power something like that right because those are big so very interesting story if you have more we would absolutely love to hear them of course if you like the show maybe you're a new listener please consider supporting it and helping keep us uh, keep this thing on the air become an EPP that's an extra podcast person get that bonus episode every single week you can do the month to month thing it's only five bucks a month or just sign up for the whole year get it done with and uh, then you're in for the full year and uh, every single week, brand new bonus episode and access to all of our previous ones too. Right now, sitting at uh, 31 bonus episodes and a brand new one coming out on Saturday. So please uh, help keep us uh, on the air and uh, support the show by becoming an EPP. Until next time, for Jenny Bruski, I'm Tony Bruski. Thanks for listening to another episode of Real Ghost Stories Online. <laughs>